Chairman, SUTD, Mr. Lee Ziyang, President, SUTD, Prof. Chong Tao Chung, Board of Trustees, SUTD, faculty, friends, families, loved ones of the class of 2019. May I just say, first of all, congratulations. Woo! You know, this is, a, this is one of the more unusual convocations or no, commencements that I've been to because I've never seen a commencement which starts off with a student band and which has songs that I can barely recognize, <laughs> even though I consider myself pretty young. And, uh, but thank you, Prof Chong, for the introduction and for inviting me uh, to speak. Actually, he left out one thing on my CV which was that actually the most important thing was I was an intern for Prof Chong, actually when he was a director of the Data Storage Institute, and that's where I got bitten by the engineering bug, and that's why I took engineering. So this was at least about, I would say, 20 years ago. Yeah, so thanks to Prof Chong. Now, I hope you are not expecting anything, you know, uh, impactful or mind-blowing from a commencement speaker like me. To be honest, you know, I still have a long life ahead, I hope. You know, I don't really have that much wisdom. I'm still accumulating it as I speak. Plenty of faculty has uh, much more wisdom. But I thought I'll just leave with you one practical suggestion, uh, which I feel is increasingly more important. It's very simple advice. And the advice is, read literature. Or read, sci read literature, and in particular, read science fiction. That's all. Simple stuff that you can take away and try to do it you know, when you go into the world of work. Now, you know, one of the most famous lines right, in English literature is this. It's from the book by Charles Dickens called A Tale of Two Cities. All right? And I'll just read out the first para for you. And I think it describes the times of the day. It reads, It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going to heaven. We were all going direct the other way, and so on and so forth. And Dickens was describing, I think, the context which the novel was set in, the French Revolution, and it was a time of great contradictions. Terrible things happened, but also, also a time of great progress, enlightenment, in living standards in society. And as what Prof. Chong said, described in his earlier presentation, we are all living, in my view, in similar times today. Plenty of exciting things have happened. He, he gave a whole list of them, right? Amazon, Uber, Grab. Lots of you uh, inventing new stuff. I must say I'm a beneficiary of Kodomo. I did not realize it came from SUTD, but you know, I wanted to teach my kids coding, and so I bought the card game. But I would say while all these things are happening and really exciting and you're entering such a bright future, uh, more and more dangers are surfacing, and these things are interlinked. Let me give you some examples, just from what uh, Prof Chong was saying, right? You look at social media, Facebook, and maybe you're not the generation anymore, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram. In a sense, we are much more connected than before. And it's often the first thing that all of us actually read, right? Every time you roll out of bed, reach for your phone, that's the first thing. If I'm lining up in a long queue, first thing I check, Facebook, right? And I no longer forget any of my friends' birthdays, right? Because Facebook gives me a reminder. And so in a sense, we are getting much more connected than ever before. We are sharing lots more news. We know what's happening in the world a lot more. I see this in my daughter. She's just 13. And you know, she grows up knowing so much more about the world because of the power of social media. But yet, if you look at it, by all objective measures, we are living in a much more polarized environment than before. Just look at, you know, the amount of, you know, there are some studies, right, about the linkages with mental health and depression with the amount of time someone spends checking Instagram and Facebook. 
Why? Because it's a very curated version of our lives, isn't it? Right, look at how Facebook, Twitter and all that, look at the impact it has on elections, creating echo chambers, rowling people up, children affected. So again, pros and cons of technology. We talk about Uber and Grab. Same thing, isn't it great that right now we don't really need to own cars anymore? Just press a button, a car pulls up at your side. You want food, press a button, half an hour later someone comes, delivers food to you. But at the same time, so you know, it's, it's so convenient, isn't it? But at the same time, you think about it, how about the workers? Workers in the gig economy today, right? They are increasingly subject and shackled by algorithms. The wages can get depressed very easily because all the, they get themselves into debt, say they rent a car, and then they have to drive. They drive to 12 to 16 hours. You see evidence of that in, in the US. How about for you guys, right, the creators, the people who are making things, right? I was at a hackathon just last year, and you know, I was very glad to see some SUTD students there. And it's amazing now how you are empowered to create so many things. You know, I, I witnessed just overnight, just in 24 hours, one team used uh, Google's TensorFlow, right? This is the AI machine learning uh, module. And they could create a sign language interpreter from scratch in just 24 hours. In other words, you, you make signs with your hands, the computer puts out a speech. Very simple, amazing stuff. It's impacted my family too. My wife just set up an online flower shop and we just managed to do it in just two hours, set up a website. I use Stripe payments so I can take payments from anywhere. Super fast. Or a friend whose mother couldn't speak English, but he helped her, and, but she runs a cleaning company. And what he told me in terms of increasing the revenue like four times was he used search engine optimization. And all you needed was to do cleaning services. The mother can't even speak English, but he worked with his mother and you now have a viable business just in the span of a day or two. Amazing. But yet more and more, if you read about it, more and more people are being left behind. Corporations' profits are actually increasing at a, a tremendous rate, but the median worker and the average worker's wages are not increasing. So I think here we are, we are actually at a hinge point, aren't we? Where we are living in an age where really... There are so many benefits to technology, but yet, you know, there are many, many dangers and we could go either way if we're not careful. Why is this so? How have we become like this? Now, I want to suggest that one of the reasons why, and this is fundamental, right, we are in such a state, is because people like yourself, scientists, technologists, don't read enough literature. And you're not engaging with the big questions. Let me, you know, if you, and this is not new, you know, if you think about it, because I was recalling in 1959, there's a famous lecture delivered by a famous uh, British chemist and novelist, this guy called C.P. Snow. And he described, right, he was talking about uh, Britain after the war and the state of education. And he described a schism between two groups, scientists, and the writers of the literary world. And he said, this is a new divide, right? Where each party was more happy to sneer at the other. So the scientists, they were very proud to say, I'm unable to quote any line of Shakespeare whatsoever. And the literary types, they were untroubled. Even if they, no, they didn't care if, to know what the second law of thermodynamics is. And I like to suggest that this is happening in our world. And as a result, this has given rise, I think, to a third player in the scene, which is populism, with its distrust of intellectuals. And so you have a powder keg of disaster waiting to happen, which is why I say read literature. Now, why is it so important to engage with the big questions and to read literature? Because all the... You know, the future that Prof Chong was sketching out, we cannot just answer it from a technological basis. And you can't leave the ethical and the philosophical questions 
to the philosophers themselves. You have to get engaged. You have to get involved. Right. Take for example, we talk about uh, the power of algorithms, right? And you know, we, we see it applied in insurance right now. We see it applied in social credit scores. And these are black boxes. So I was having a conversation with uh, the Facebook head of privacy, and we were talking about the impact of black boxes and how this could be influenced, right? You know, ju just imagine, just one tweak, you could influence algorithms that serves you news feeds, whether it's racial bias, special interests. And these are real moral, ethical dilemmas that people have to deal with. Healthcare. I think healthcare is going to be really, really big. Uh, and it's probably the next uh, realm ripe for disruption. We see gene editing now, right, using CRISPR. But again, moral, ethical dilemmas out of this. Or take, for example, climate change. I imagine in future, we'll be able to have some breakthrough, whether it's in terms of carbon capture, sequestration, whether it's in terms of using geoengineering to deal with climate change. But again, this is a massive scale change to our planet's fundamental systems. Are we dealing with this on an ethical and you know, philosophical perspective? And I think in order to do this, you cannot leave this to the civil servants like me, right? You, as people who are trained in technology and science, you as people who are inventing the thing, you have to stay engaged. You need, we need the most sophisticated experts, the people who understand this deep down, right? To engage in the toughest questions of our time. Where, what, how should these new inventions be shaped, be engaged? And this is no laughing matter. This is a really serious matter. I have visited many companies. I've engaged many CEOs of tech firms. And I must say, not all tech firms are, are created equal, unfortunately. And don't get me wrong. These are some of the smartest people around. Right? The, the engineers that I meet in all these big companies, they are paid great amounts of money, which probably shows why your graduate employment survey is doing quite well. You're in the right spot. But it worries me sometimes when I see some of these best minds, right, spending their IQ and their intellectual analysis, trying to create, oh, how do I optimize the routing algorithm to make sure that I can get from here to Bukit Batok in one minute earlier, right? How do I help the company achieve more, create more time for children to stay on their phones for another two minutes or something so that I can increase my advertising revenue without quite engaging the larger questions of philosophy, of morals, of values. And that's one thing which I hope you will take away, right? Which is that what are the big questions that you need to stay engaged in? I would say SUTD is the right place to start but I hope it's not the place you end. I know that it has been teaching you aspects of design, and I think that's great because technology cannot stand by itself. It must be applied with empathy. You must understand the user. And so you graduates are standing at this intersection. But I think this is only a starting point. I hope it's not the end. And I hope that when in future, you ask yourself, right, Instead of asking yourself, right, how to get the next billion users onto your product, you also have to ask yourself the larger question behind, right? What does this mean for the billions of users that will touch my product? And all this, to come back to my starting point, requires you to read literature. Right? Because in literature, you realize life is not black and white. It's not like an equation. It's grey. There are many possibilities. Because, you know, there's a saying, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And so if you don't consider all these implications right from the beginning, it'll be too late. So let me recommend a few things for you to start. And perhaps as SUTD, I will recommend some science fiction books. So one, I highly recommend this Chinese science fiction book called The Three-Body Problem by Liu Tzu Xin. Another book that you might 
want to read is Nexus by Ramanam, Rames Nam. Another, one, another favorite writer of mine is Neil Stevenson, Cryptonomicon, Cryptonomicon, and others. But get a start and continue to stay engaged. Read more fiction, read more science fiction. Get engaged with the moral, ethical dilemmas of the day. And I'm sure if you do that, our world will be a better place and we can journey to the world through better design. Thanks very much.